All right, so I'm hoping that now it's coming through as it should. You can let me know. All right, can you hear me? Can you see me? Everything's good. All right, awesome. Let's roll. All right, well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Thanks for tuning in again. Um, today we're gonna continue talking about uh, or working on the project that we were doing last time. Um, if you're new to the stream, essentially what was going on, what, or what we're trying to do is we're trying to analyze the Kaggle archive data set, um, which if, if you're not familiar with archive, it's basically this sort of collection or repository of uh, journal articles or academic articles that get written and they get published on there on different topics like um, you know astrophysics, computer science, mathematics, so on and so forth. So we're just trying to analyze that data set. Um, the data set itself has, is uh, a, a single JSON file that contains three gigs. And this file uh, was essentially too big for us to, to sort of read with using standard methods like system.io uh, and you know, system text JSON. So what we did was we, last time on stream, we set up uh, .NET for Apache Spark, and we were able to successfully uh, read the file and do some very basic uh, sort of um, analysis on it. So today we're just gonna continue working on that. Um, I'm, I'm still not sure which way I wanna go with it uh, in terms of whether I want to perform some of my analysis on uh, uh, using .NET for Apache Spark, or if I just wanna use .NET for Apache Spark to sort of cut down my data set so that then I can I can use it uh, along with more traditional methods like the, uh, like the, like using system.io, system text JSON, and, uh, and also working with, um, the data frame API, right? But before we start doing that work, just wanna bring two things to your attention. One is that it's that time again, the .NET community standup is happening uh, today in a few hours actually at 10 a.m., sorry. Yeah, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time, uh, Eastern Standard Time. And yeah, so on this episode, uh, Haiping, who is uh, a, a member of the SciShip, Sci, Sci Sharp uh, team, right? Those are the folks behind uh, projects such as NumSharp and TensorFlow.net. Uh, we'll be on, and he's going to talk about the project and you know just get to know a little bit more uh, about it. You know why why he started the project or sort of some of the reasons to why .NET and stuff like that. So if you're interested in hearing about that and basically learning about the SciSharp project, uh, feel free to tune in. I'll paste the link into the chat. All right, so that's that. The other thing, uh, are if you are interested in learning F-sharp, the ninth round for 2020 fall, uh, is now open. So it's the F Sharp Software Foundation is taking applications so that you can participate as a mentee uh, in in learning F Sharp. And there's different tracks. So some things, uh, you know, they, they may range anywhere from, you know, if, if you're really just starting out and you don't know F Sharp very well, it's you have the intro to uh, F Sharp track, you have more of a deep dive into F Sharp. Um, you also have uh, you also have, uh, you know, tracks that guide you down. How can you contribute to the compiler? Uh, you have some on the machine learning track, things like that. If you are experienced with F Sharp um, or have knowledge in, in some of those areas, how long is the track for mentees? Uh, it seems like it's six to eight weeks and you meet for about 60 to 90 minutes a week. So... Um, yeah, so it's 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 uh, it's definitely a commitment, but it's not that much of a commitment. Um, you know, it's it's about two months and meeting for an hour, which is pretty much kind of how long uh, my stream lasts, right? So if you think about it, it's it's really not a lot of time, and you'll get to kind of focus on you know your specific um, goals, right? So let's say that perhaps you know you're you're fairly good at this one thing, you can work with your mentee, sorry, with your mentor 
uh, to to kind of uh, work through those things that you feel that you might need a little bit more reinforcement on. Um, so yeah, and and that's for mentees. Now, if you are a mentor and you want to teach others on any of those tracks, you can also apply, right? And uh, so I applied as a mentor for both the intro to F sharp as well as the machine learning tracks. So yeah, I'm really excited to, to take part and, uh, you know, meet some cool people and uh, work on, on interesting projects and helping folks adopt it. While at the same time, I learn myself, you know, uh, that's kind of one of the things that uh, is sort of disclaim here, right? For prospective mentors, it's, um, you know, you always have that thought like, hey, you know, I'm not really good at this thing, or, you know, I'm not an expert or stuff like that, things like that. Um, And that's okay, right? Um, I I think you certainly need to have some knowledge, right? But at the end of the day, you also don't need to have all the answers and you can learn together, right? It's a great learning experience uh, as you try to tackle some some of these problems uh, that, that you're working through with your mentee. So, uh, you know, if, if that sort of voice is telling you, hey, I'm not good enough at this and you want to be a mentor, don't don't let that discourage you. Um, you know, I, I'm sure you you're fine and you're perfectly capable. I know I have a lot of knowledge that you can share with folks. So make sure to check those things out. With that said, let's go and do a little bit of data analysis. see here all right so as always uh, add new host oh uh, open configuration file as always for some reason uh, every time and I mean I, I don't I'm not mad about this um, my IP address seems to change on the VM that we have set up on Azure um, so Every time I restart it, it, it for some reason, uh, uh, to host, uh, for some reason I have to always, uh, set that VM, uh, up, right. So are you sure you want to continue? Sure. Yep. So I think I'm on now. Let me open a folder and I want to open stream projects, archive analytics. Okay. <clears throat> so um, I recently found out that there's this really cool thing that you can do. And uh, and uh, I, I guess I could show it off on stream. So when we start when we started working with um, working with uh, Spark, we did it through a console application, right? So we created an F-sharp console application. Um, and that's fine, but as you can see, or as you might imagine, right, you kind of have to know ahead of time uh, some of the operations that you may want to perform. Uh, and, and you can't really, you kind of have to run this thing all the time, right? Like the categories that show, right? Um, and as a result, it, you know, it's, it's, it might be difficult for, for like debugging or sort of interactively trying to change up the queries and transformations that you're performing on your data set, right? So what if there was a way that you could uh, use Jupyter Notebooks? And in fact, for, if you're using Spark with, say, for example, uh, PySpark, right, which is the, the Python bindings or the Python implementation of uh or how you're able to interact with Spark via Python, uh, using notebooks is actually quite quite a uh, very popular uh, or commonly used uh, scenario, right? Now, what if we could use Jupyter Notebooks with .NET for Apache Spark, right? Now, that would make things very interesting. Now, again, I, I think at the moment, right, there's, there are certainly limitations with, with the, you know, Jup- with Jupyter Notebooks in general, mainly uh, around um, sort of... Um, uh, getting better IntelliSense, you get some IntelliSense, but you know you also you you don't get this support, right? So if you were to go something like categories dot show, right? 
you have all this uh, information, right, and documentation that can kind of help you decide, okay, here's what I need to provide. Um, that's not really the case with Jupyter Notebooks at the moment, right? That experience, of course, is improving, but, you know, it has its limitations. But despite its limitations, it's, uh, for, for this type of workflow, it might be something that, that may be of interest to us. So how exactly can you go about talking to .NET for Apache Spark through Jupyter Notebooks? And it's actually fairly easy. We're just going to modify. Um, okay. I'm just going to create a file here, an executable, uh, because I don't want to have to keep typing this command and I don't want to remember. Actually, in fact, I don't remember it. Uh, so it's notebook.sh. Sure, we can call it notebook.sh. And what's going to go in here is basically the front part of Submit. Um, so let's do this just to make it easier to read. Oh, um, so the only thing that's going to change, and let me actually do the same thing to my run command here. That way, um, it's just easier to, to, to read. Okay. Okay. So you'll notice that the key difference. So whenever you're submitting jobs to .NET for Apache Spark, you start with the Spark submit command, right? And in here, you're basically telling it, hey, I want you to leverage this .NET runner uh, class, right, inside of this, uh, inside of the jar file um, to basically make the connections and bindings so that you're able to basically interpret uh, .NET right as in, in, inside of the Spark engine. Uh, you tell it where what the location of your um, sort of your your node is right. In this case, we're just working with the local node, but of course, um, you know you could provide uh, sort of uh, uh, the IP address of containing the location of where your sort of uh, head sort of executor or the main controller of your club of your Spark cluster uh, may live, right? Uh, and then you're telling it, hey, use this. You know, this is the the jar file they're going to use. I pres I believe that this class here lives inside of this jar file. I I'm not quite sure, but I but I believe that that's the case. And then once that's done, then you just call the command .net and provide the DLL containing your application, right? And then it's just it, it goes ahead and submits uh, that job and runs that DLL or that program, uh, in, you know, using Spark. Okay. Now. When you are now in a very similar fashion, you do the exact same thing, right? Spark submit, you do your class, you tell it the location of your head sort of executor. Um, you can tell it the, the, the jar file they're going to be using, and then you tell it .NET. The only difference is instead of providing the DLL, you set it, you start it, you start the, the, the Spark uh, session or the Spark submission in debug mode. Now, what this is going to do is, it's going to essentially uh, open up a port and it's going to listen for connections. And it's going to be like, hey, I'm, I'm listening. I'm ready to, to start taking on work. At that point, you can then bind to your, uh, to, to, you can bind to this sort of um, running process, Spark running process, and execute uh, sort of interactively the commands. And in this case, so so while one case could be you're doing this uh, by by um, essentially um, attaching to a debugger, right? So you could attach to a debugger and debug your application. For example, we could debug uh, this application here. In this case, what we're going to do is we're going to basically talk to the running Spark job via Jupyter Notebooks. So... I hope that kind of made sense, but if not, I'll just show it and you'll kind of see what, what I mean. But first let's make our, um, notebook. Uh, plus X, uh, notebook. All right. So we just made notebook executable. Let me make that a little bit bigger. 
Oh. Um, mm -mm 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 -mm. Let's see. So the run command seems to, oh, 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 I see what I did. That's what happened, I forgot that. Okay, so we're just gonna wait a little bit for this job to finish. Um, I just don't, I don't wanna <clears throat> sort of let it sit there or, or stop it while it's executing. It shouldn't wait too long. So right now I, I'm just running the regular console application. I'm not running the actual debug um, application. You'll see once this job finishes, uh, what running that, um, essentially what running this uh, debug operation will will sort of look like Let's see here dun, dun, dun. all right 17 18 out of 21 All right, and I think now it's cleaning up. All right, cool. So that job finished. So now, whoops, not again. <laughs> but, uh, no. Books, right? Whoa, what happened here? Uh, Spark submit class local. And the only difference now is above. Not execute binary file. Mix spell the dot net command. No, I didn't. Could I because specify field key equals master value equals local to environment? Okay. You try to uh, dot, but dot net debug does not exist. Um, okay, so give me one second. Let's try to fix this. See, this is why you should actually read the documentation instead of instead of here trying to guess. So how to guys debug. Oh, it's just a bug. It's not .NET debug, it's debug. All right. So now that I have actually read the documentation, There it is. I hope that you're able to see this, right? So it says port number used by .NET backend is 5567. Again, uh, .NET uh, backend is running in debug mode. So at this point, um, you can either bind your debugger to your debugger binds to this port, or you can start Jupyter Notebooks. So let's go ahead and do that. So make their notebooks. Okay, so now there's the notebooks, uh, CD notebooks, and then Jupyter notebook. Ah, how am I gonna be able to log into here now though? All right, let's try this, Jupyter notebook. Um, IP equals zero, 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 zero. All right.
So at this point, I'm hoping that lets me connect. Do a little bit of uh, Sorry, give me one second. I'm just trying to. Um, set up the network so that I'm actually able to connect to this. All right, let me try this again. So it's not working. Um, let me go ahead then in that case, um, let me stop this for a second and let me do a little bit of port forwarding. Is it remote? Let's see. Yep. Jupyter Notebook. All right, so now if I do a local host, awesome, beautiful. So that's actually easier. So what I did to get this working is uh, the remote SSH extension uh, has this um, thing here, this setting where you're uh, allowed to forward ports. So what I've done is I forwarded the 8888 port, which is where um, my Jupyter Notebooks is listening. And as you can see, I was able to just directly uh, access that. So. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, your question, user to you, um, just curious, can you set up guests to use your Azure VM and notebooks? I suppose the answer to that is yes. The answer to that is, is, is yes. Um, one way that it could work um, is one way that it could work is yeah one way that it could work is I set up this using root or whatever or some sort of you know pseudo privileges I create this VM and I install all the software on it right so I um, I, I install the software I install uh, you know, .NET Interactive, I installed .NET for Apache Spark, basically everything that I've been working with here. Um, and then what I can do is I can create users, right, that don't have root privileges, uh, and I can basically give them access to this VM, right? Um, and, and they're able to, you know, interact and play with this VM, but they are not able to, um, you know, they're, they're not able to do much else, right? They, like, you wouldn't be able to install things uh, or, or, or whatever, right, or, or upgrade packages or up, do anything on the VM, right? So very standard for, for working with VMs, right? You set up a VM and you give, create users on it. Um, 
so that's that's a way that I could see it working. Yeah. If, if like if, if if you wanted to set this up so that you know you can maybe share with with your colleagues, your friends, right? You can certainly do that. Uh, and the follow-up is, isn't that what Binder is like? Um, yes. To, well, to a certain extent, it kind of is. What Binder allows you to do is it allows you to stand up uh, using containers. It allows you to stand up Jupyter Notebooks, fair, Jupyter Notebook environments fairly easily. Um, I'm not sure how it does with collaboration though. So yeah, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really sure how it does. Uh, notebooks. Sorry, give me one second. Um, under notebooks and then here I'm gonna go local host. Eight 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 eight. Of course. Um, binder. <laughs> Jupyter notebooks. Yeah. So 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 by the way that binders kind of like what what this saying right. Um, let's say that you have a repository. Let, my repository, for example. And I created an image that contains .NET, Jupyter Notebooks, that, uh, or .NET Interactive, Jupyter Notebooks, and .NET for Apache Spark. I can create an image, a Docker image, using that repo. And then with Binder, um, it would essentially uh, go ahead and create a, uh, it would create that environment for you, right? So you'd be able to sort of recreate the environment because, again, it's, it's, it's using containers from, from what I understand. Um, but you, like, you wouldn't have access to, to my stuff if that makes sense, right? Um, so, so it's, you could do, kind of do it with Binder, but at the same time, not really. Yeah. And I see that there's this thing, so... Let me go ahead and provide the token. Exactly, user to you. It's it's like a specialized container platform. Yeah, so it's it's built for Jupyter notebooks or Jup not Jupyter notebooks specifically because I I I have to kind of watch what I say because Jupyter notebooks is a way like this is Jupyter notebooks, but there's Jupyter Lab as well, right? Which is more of the IDE way of interacting with it, and you can do Jupyter Lab with Binder, right? So this sort of Jupyter ecosystem, right? It, Binder is built to sort of handle those types of workloads, um, and be under the scenes, right? Like if, if you see here, right, how it works, you provide the URL, you enter your repository information, and a Docker image is built for you, right? Um, and of course, you can define right? Uh, you can define additional things that you may want specific to your, uh, you know, to, to what your environment should look like. And, and, and Binder will sort of package those things up nicely for you. So, yeah. Um, all right. So let's see here. All right. So we're good on Jupyter server. We have our Jupyter server running and we're good on dot, dot for Apache Spark running, right? So again, we basically just started it in debug mode. Now it's just waiting for connections, waiting for something to bind to this port. And here we have Jupyter notebooks. And now we want to go ahead <clears throat> and create a notebook, right? So new F sharp. So I'm going ahead and I'm going to call it, um, I don't know, archive. Yes, I can. Thank you. All right. So here I'm providing nickname name, archive, um, uh, date, load data, right? 
So I just provide a name. Um, let me make it a little bit bigger. And here, all we need to do here is Microsoft.spark, comma, 0 0.12.1. Again, we're, we're, so we're here we're going to install the Microsoft Spark NuGet package. Uh, and we're, again, specifying that version because, remember, we're using the 0 0.12.1.net worker, uh, which we installed last time. So you got to make sure that the NuGet version that you install is the same as that of your uh, .net worker. Okay, so a little bit of that. Open Microsoft.spark, open Microsoft.spark.sql. Okay, so that's installed. We open up our packages. And now let's literally take the script that we had here, right? Why are we going to sort of reinvent the wheel? Uh, so let's start off by doing this, right? And we just define our data directory, right? Which is where that, where we have our, our data. And then we initialize Spark session. Uh, okay, boom. Spark session. Things are happening. There it is. T check that out. Using port 5567 for connection. So boom, we're bound and we can double check that. Here in our laws, where is it? There we go. Submitted application archive analytics, right? Archive analytics. So boom, we're in, right? And at this point, we just interact with it, right? So uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, archive data. Let's read our data. Uh, all right. Now nothing's actually happening, I don't think. Categories. There's one thing that I want to try here. All right. What's going on here? Archive data. All right, there it is. So it took a little bit of while <clears throat> for that to read, but again, it's a three gig file. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay. All right. So there's our categories, and what's the last part? Then it's just show us the top 10. Actually, you know what? Um, what happens? Okay, so if I do that, there's nothing. That show 10. So stuff is happening, stuff is happening. And you see there's 7 out of 21, 8 out of 21. So the exact same process that's going on as if you were running your application is taking place here. The difference is that now you're taking it step by step and you don't have to run the entire application. So for example, um, let's say that something was broken here, right? Uh, you wouldn't know ahead of time um, because you, you have to run your entire application. Now in this case, right, we only have one query, but imagine if you had multiple queries. Um, sorry, total number of categories. Um, I don't know what it was, but we can we can check that, right? Um, I can run a query against that. So let's see. So there it is, right? Your categories and your counts, right? There's astrophysics, which is the top one. And and basically here what we did, just for folks who may not, may not tune in for the last stream, uh, we're basically just taking the categories uh, column, right? Which contains these categories. I guess in this case, it's uh, astrophysics. Uh, maybe quantum, uh, I believe, uh, CS, which I believe is for computer science and math, right? So those are the categories that the articles belong to. And then all we're doing is we're just grouping it by the categories and then taking account of that uh, and ordering in descending order, right? Ordering the count in descending order. And then we just tell it show as a top 10, right? Or, or the first 10. Uh, and, and, and there it is. That's what this outputs. 
So at this point, right, if your question, uh, your question, right, user to you is, um, well, what is the total number of categories? Good question. We could answer that. Um, the only thing that I'm going to have trouble with is uh, uh, .NET API. All right, so let's consult the API documentation because Oh, sorry, it's not ML.NET. I'm so used to going to the ML.NET documentation that now it's literally like a, it's like muscle memory. All right, so we want to do stuff on the data frame. Let's see, methods. Um, mm -mm -mm. There we go. Categories, returns that contains only new rows. This is an alias, drop duplicates. Okay, drop duplicates. All right, so what we can do here is we have, so we have categories already. So what we can do is uh, we can tell it category, oh, whoops. Sorry, I don't want to do it here. I want to do that here. Uh, user to you, do you have a game plan for what you are trying to query? Um, not exactly. To be honest, um, I think I think that there are a few things that I think there are a few things that we want to we, we like to learn about our data set. And I think that that's part of the thing about data exploration, right? When you're exploring data, um, yes, you should have questions in mind that pertain to your specific problem, right? Um, in this case, uh, I'm not exactly trying to achieve a goal per se. Uh, I'm just trying to learn a little bit more about the data set. Such as, for example, here we were able to answer the question, okay, well, which category has the most publications? Um, can we do better, right? Could we uh, basically get this? And in addition to that, maybe uh, get the year, right? So, so I think, um, let me, uh, so archive data, if I were to go archive data dot show, um, I don't know, 10. And this is a really bad thing, right? But, um, first comments, abstract authors. I wonder if there's a date for publication or a date of publication. It might be cleaner to see it here. Kaggle uh, archive data set. <clears throat> so something that might be interesting to see is like, okay, well, we see as a whole, right? Um, astrophysics tends to be the one that has the most publications. But what if we were to break it down by year, right? Uh, how, how does that look like? You know, perhaps some years there was more of this or there was more of that. There we go. Update date. I think that's the closest we can get to it because um, I don't see an actual publish date here. Um, but yeah, uh, so so that's another question we might ask. Like, okay, well now now we know what the top categories are as a whole. Can we break it down by year? Uh, something else we might want to know is who is the most published author, right? Uh, who is the most published author who put out the most papers on a specific year? Um, you know, uh, something that we might want to also look at maybe um, maybe we can extract the title and s see like okay well which words or terms were the most common in titles um, you know that 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 like which which terms in the titles were most common uh, or, or, or were or most likely appeared in in these publications right? So things like that might be interesting to see. Um, and again, it, for, for in terms of having a game plan or a goal or stuff like that, uh, we're just trying to play with uh, or, or tinker with uh, .NET for Apache Spark and trying to find some interesting insights from this data. So there's no defined goal per se, um, but we're just really trying, I'm just trying to really learn a little bit more about this data set in general. Um, at some point though, what I would like to do is once we've you know uh, analyzed the data a bit and, and we're a little bit more comfortable with it, uh, perhaps building some sort of uh, predictive model, right? Um, oh no, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm all open. I'm up for suggestions. Yeah, I, 
I am not, you know, sort of tied down to one specific, uh, you know, set of queries that I want to make. I'm, I'm up for it. The, like the more engaging or, and sort of like interactive that this becomes, uh, the better for me. Let's see. So what were we trying to do? Um, oh, right. So we were trying to answer the question. Um, what were the top number of categories, right? So what we can then do is we can do uh, let um, total categories. Oh, on the predictive side of things, I was thinking we can take, um, well, not, it wouldn't be predictive, but it would be more of like some sort of like classification model, right? So uh, if you notice here, right, there's a, there's the title, uh, there's the abstract, which you're able to get, and there is the title, right? So if you take the abstract and the title, set them up as feature columns, right? You featureize the text, uh, and you have the category that it belongs to, right? Could we, you know, based on the, on the title, ca automatically categorize these things? So you can think of a system where in the future, right? Instead of, instead of uh, you know somebody going in and saying, or or even the authors having to say, oh well, this is the category it belongs to. You just provide the data, such as your title and your abstract, and the system would automatically sort of you know ass assign a category or a label to your uh, publication, right? So so eventually that's that's where where I like to get to. But in terms of exploring the data and asking questions and and learning from the data set, I'm 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 open for for suggestions. Uh, let's see. So total categories. So what we're going to do is we're going to take categories dot select functions dot com uh, category dot count. I wonder if this is going to work. Okay, so it failed. Uh, and what cannot resolve category functions? And why is that? Because it's called categories, not categories. Uh -huh. Yeah, so essentially, we're, we're selecting this column here, we're getting all the distinct values, and then we're getting a count on that. So let's see. All right. Uh, does not define field constructor type. Does not define the field constructor dot show. Oh. Oh, there you go. So, uh, total the total number of categories is sixty thousand. Okay, let's see. Uh, so what you were saying is a predictive side of things. Cool. So I'd be curious extrapolating the number of categories by year. Number of categories by year. Okay. Yeah. Let's see if we can do that. So, you know what? I don't want. I don't want to keep going back to this. Um, what is the way? Let's see. Columns. Uh, returns all the column names. Perfect. That's exactly what I want because you know what I keep sort of going back here um and let me actually get rid of this because i don't it's really noisy but what i want to do is archive data dot columns okay i guess i have to boom okay perfect so this looks a little bit nicer in terms of what the columns are um mm -mm -mm -mm. okay so there's categories and what we want to do and you know what let's Let's add a little bit of documentation, right? That way it's a little bit, and this is the nice thing about, um, okay, uh, import, let's see, import um, Spark dependencies, Spark packages, right? Whoops. All right, so here what we wanna do is we are uh, define, um, data path 
K A no. And by the way, uh, you're not seeing me do anything here. Uh, there is real this really cool thing here in Jupyter Notebook. So if you go to um, help and then you go to keyboard shortcuts, it sort of tells you all the things that you can sort of do, right? So in this case, right, um, what is it? Help, uh, keyboard shortcuts. Um, change cell to code. Okay. So for example, here, if I set, if I do Y, there's different types of cells, right? You can uh, have code, markdown, or raw and be convert. So in this case, it's a code cell. Whenever it has this little thing here, it's a code cell. And you can do that by, you know, pressing Y. But in this case, I don't want to have a, um, I'm not going to have uh, the code cell. I'm going to press M, right? And it converts it to a markdown. And then I can just, you know, uh, convert it to markdown. So incorporating visual graphs. Uh, so the question is, are you going to incorporate visual graphs? And that's another nice thing about Jupyter. I want to. I certainly do. I don't know how, I don't know how well the Spark data frame uh, works with xplotplotly. Um, so that's the only limitation that, and, and I'm going to put limitation in quotes because I, I want to th believe that it's possible. I don't know though. So we can, but we can figure that out on stream, right? So initialize, uh, spark session, All right? Um, load data. Okay. Get column name. Uh, display column names. Uh, what am I doing? Um, this one's going to be um, ba -ba -ba categories. Uh, get the top, get the count of, get the category count in descend order. This one was get the total number of unique categories. Uh, I am. So this is going to live in github.com stream. So it's going to be in stream projects, but it's not going to be in the master branch. It's going to be in this archive data set project. Um, so it's going to be in the archive data set. Make a little bit bigger this archive data set project uh, branch, and you're going to find that in the archive analytics directory, right? Um, so get the total, the total number of unique categories, right? And the total. Okay. So now what we want to do is we want to, what we're we going to go for, let's see, the number of article by categories by year. Okay. So let's see. We're going to build this query in parts. So published categories, categories by year. Whoops. Can't even spell. All right. So, um, so let's see. Let's go back to this because I like how this looks. If we were to look at the, so we don't, the only thing that I'm having a real problem with here is this update date. Um, Yeah, this is the only thing that I have a problem with. Um, I don't know if this is um, so sorry. Make it, maybe make it a little bit bigger. This update date. Um, notice the form. There's this this column called update date. 
I don't know if this is exactly a published date, but this is the best thing we have to go on. So let's go for it. So we want to get um, our original data set, right? So let's categories by year, SQL to um, our archive data, what I called it. Uh, yeah, archive data. Dot select functions dot call. Uh, functions dot call. So in this case, it's going to be what categories uh, up update year. So update underscore update date up the underscore date. Dates. All right, so let's see if this works. Categories by year that show 10. All right, awesome. So we get our categories and we're going to update date. Okay, perfect. Now what we want to do, though, is we want to split uh, this update date based on Right, so then dot select uh, ba, 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 functions dot call uh, update date. And I noticed that it's 11.04. Let's, since I started a bit late, let's go to, through 11.15 and see where this gets us. Select uh, dot split. Uh, oh, actually, um, Split call call functions dot call up update date um, mm, 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 update date comma and this one is going to be uh, oh, the split is going to be this. So essentially, what I'm doing here is there is this, let me make this bigger. There is this, where is the source show select schema sample, random split functions column, column methods. Where is it? Is it on the data frame? Operators? Properties? Oh, sorry, functions, methods. There it is. Um, There it is, split. All right, so split and you give it a column and a string, what you're splitting on, and that's how you're able to sort of get that. Mm, this might be interesting though. There's other two date. Oh, I like this. Let's start with the split and then we'll see if maybe we can use one of these built-in functions to optimize it. And then what I want to do is I want to give it an alias uh, called uh, split date. Okay. No. Okay. Oh, uh, sorry. It's going to be functions dot call uh, categories comma right so I still I still want to keep these rows there we go okay so I have my split day here but now I just want to extract the uh, the first value here so how do I do that functions. Um, I think I saw some array functions here. Array um, position. 
let's see. Locus up is in first occurrence of the value of the given array as a long. Now, array creates a new array column. Now, cat needs all the elements. No, that's not what I want. Let's see, collect list. No. Let's see, date trunk, decode, degrees, descending, explode. What does explode do? Whoops. Uh, explode. Creates a new rule for each element and give it a map or column. Let's try this one. Let's try this one. So we're going to try to use the first, right? So, so now what I want to do is I want to do select functions dot call categories, comma functions dot call first functions dot call uh, split date. All right. And why does this work? Sequence this category is not an aggregate function. Dot call. Okay. All right, let me try something a little bit different. So let's category, let parse date is equal to, um, what is this list parse date is equal to archive data. It, it is, it's a, uh, it's an array. So you'll see that split data is an array here. Because the original, the original date is just, um, it's this, right? It's just a string. And with the split, we, we convert it into an array. So let's see here. Archive data dot select functions dot call uh, update date. Is that what it's called? Yeah. Update date select split uh, functions call update date um, comma comma dash this what happened split is oh all right so there's that right and I want to give it a uh, dot alias uh, split date. All right. Cool. Split date. Now what I want to do is I want to do a uh, parse date. Let's um, combine date to uh, parse date dot select uh, fun, um, first. Um, function. 
change.com square thing. Alright. Oh, sorry. Um, year. Uh, year dot show. <clears throat> mm -mm. That's not it. Our last day length. Uh, well, mm. what is this map from a race? Creates a new map column. No, I don't want to create a map. Months. Oh, okay, so you can use year. All right, so let's try that. So let's see. Get rid of this, get rid of this. Um, let's forget the split. Let's do functions.year. That was easier, <laughs> way easier than what I'm trying to do. Okay, um, all right, so that's pretty easy. Uh, so what we can we can literally get rid of all of this, right? And then we we'll just tell it functions dot call. Oh, sorry, uh, year functions call update date. Uh huh. Dot alias year. Is that, is that right? Yep. And we can actually get rid of this. We can get rid of this one too. All right? Boom. There it is. So there's a category and there's a year. Um, okay. So now that we know this, There's a year category. So now what we want to do is want to group by year category. We want to group by year and category. And then we want to um, want to group by year category and get the count. So, uh, all right. So now that we got know this. Let's take, um, let's, uh, I don't know, category, root category by year. Okay, so let's say categories by year, by year. So um, group, group by uh, functions.call. Right, it would be descending, functions.call. Um, functions that call, uh, we want, what was it? Categories functions that call here dot counts dot, uh, order by, um, we, actually, you know what? Let's just do this for now just to see if this query gets us what we want.
Yep, there it is. There's a category, there's a year, and there's a count. All right. So now, uh, dot order by um, year. Year dot descending dot um, functions dot call categories Beautiful. That worked. Okay. So what happened here was we we did two order buys. We ordered it by um, first of all we ordered it by by year in descending order, right? So starting with the twenty twenties, and then all the way down, and then we ordered the categories in ascending order, right? So in in alpha alphabetical order. So that's where we get Astro of PH for twenty twenty one two three. Um, okay. So this is cool, um, but now, right, I actually like the results of this analysis. Um, sorry, oh, you were saying how many total years? Uh, yeah, that should be pretty easy to, to get, right? Um, actually, you know what, before I do that, um, let me, uh, categories by year, let me get rid of, this and do a little bit um, add on to this query here, All right? So group by categories by year, get rid of this one here. If we run this here, Perfect. Okay, so this this gives us the same re same result. Um, so now we can take um, this one, right? Um, let total articles per year uh, is equal to um, categories. What is it? Categories by year. Um, dot group select um, year or uh, dot group by uh, functions dot call year dot count Take a while. All right, I know I said 11.15, but I'm actually, all right, this is cool. But what I want now is order by, um, what should we order? Well, let's order by, uh, ba -ba -ba -ba, order by um, functions dot call uh, year dot descending, all right? Let's order it by descending. And let's see what we. All 
All right, there it is. Whoa, that is amazing. Check that out. So, um, well, that's, oh, uh, that's actually interesting because I don't know if, I don't know uh, how many years are there in total. So if we were to say, for example, do, um, um, if we were to do something like uh, per year, dot select year uh, functions dot call year dot um, distinct dot count. Let's see what this comes back at. So let's see how many years uh, are in the data set. Oh, four, yeah, so uh, we can't do it by 25 years because uh, there's only 14 years in the data set. Um, but this is cool, right? So, so check this out. <laughs> um, this is an actually interesting insight. So we're not even done with the year, right? Um, and there have been more submissions in 2020 than there have been in 2019. Pretty interesting. Uh, I'm going to guess that people had more time with COVID and they just published papers uh, I don't know, but that's an interesting insight, right? Or maybe more people like the site has become more popular, uh, and, and people just start submitting there more. Um, I don't know, but this is certainly an insight that we can, you know, maybe try to identify. Um, oh, well, you know what the other thing might be, right? So not kind of going along the COVID, uh, sort of, you know, thought process or idea, there may be all these research papers that are COVID specific and, you know, like how, you know, which, which medications may work or something like that. Um, well, it's actually the, it, it's a subset in the sense that we're only looking at specific columns. Uh, but in terms of the data set, it's actually the entire data set. So remember, we, we did not truncate the data set uh, at any point. We told it give us the whole data set, except I only want to look at these specific columns, right? So this is the entire this is data from the entire data set. Um, and and in terms of, uh, yeah, so. Oh, sorry. Um, user two by by this is a subset of the whole data set. Do you mean that the cag the data set on Kaggle is not the whole thing? And that's possible. So if, if you're referring to that. In terms of the queries that we've done here, we performed it on on the entire data set, on the three gigs that we have. Now, it's entirely possible that the three gigs don't contain the entire data set. And as sort of suggested uh, on here, right, um, where was it? Yeah, there's 30 years of archived data, right? So it, it seems like not the whole data set has been uploaded, right? So, so you are right. It is a subset um, in the sense that not all the data is available, but we have been working with the entire data set available at this point. But yeah, that's a really good call out. Yeah, okay. So I went way over, um, but I'm really happy with our progress. Uh, this is really cool. This is really exciting. Thanks for all the um, really good uh, suggestions in terms of queries. And um, yeah, let me let me let me just pause it here. Uh, well, before I do that, let me go ahead and um, pause a few other things. Job twenty six finished. Is it still running? Jobs. Yep, next Monday, same time. Let me just make sure next Monday. And I'm especially excited about next Monday because next Monday I, fingers crossed, will have my Surface Duo. So maybe it makes an appearance on stream. Um, so yeah, let me let me actually uh, commit this to source control. So let me stop uh, the Jupyter server. Um, stop this, and let me stop the Jupyter server. OK, 
Okay, yes. All right, cool. All right, and let me get stars. Get add, get status, get commit, um, added notebook with query spark. Isn't that what I did? Oh, I did GTI, not git. Okay. Uh, let's see. Get status. Git push origin archive data set project. All right, we're in business. So um, you should see all these queries or the results of these queries on the um, on the GitHub repo that I pasted. And yeah, I look forward to seeing folks on the on the stream later today, the machine learning stand up. So yeah, thanks again for joining. This was a lot of fun. And uh, I'll catch you uh, on Monday, 10am, same time. Thanks. See you later. Bye.